Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Brad Smith. On this Friday, let's get you up to speed on the market action with one hour left to go in the trading week. Uh, we've got uh, red arrows across the board right now. The Dow down 230 points roughly, the S&P 500 down 50, and the Nasdaq seeing the steepest losses on the day, down about 1.6% there with tech the biggest decliner in terms of sectors. On the economic front, we did get inflation expectations falling to its lowest level in two and a half years. University of Michigan's consumer sentiment survey showing uh, that the inflation expectations fell to 3.1% in September, although the overall sentiment did decline in the month. Uh, also, we are watching oil very closely today, continuing to hold above that $90 a barrel level. WTI crude right now at $91 a barrel, up about 1%. Brad, this all ties in well to the big story of the day, which is, of course, the car makers and the big focus there. Yeah, I was going to say sentiment, not the only thing coming out of Michigan in terms of big news here today, Akiko. United Auto Workers making history as 13,000 union members go on strike simultaneously against the big three automakers. Currently, the strike is targeting specifically GM, Ford and Stellantis. Those plants, they are in focus here uh, instead of a full work stoppage. President Biden has refrained from weighing in heavily on the negotiations until today, delivering remarks where he throws a lot of support behind the union. Take a look. And uh, they've been around the clock and the companies have made some significant offers. But I believe they should go further to ensure record corporate profits mean record contracts for the UAW. Let me say that again. Record corporate profits, which they have should be shared by record contracts for the UAW. President Biden went on to say that he is sending acting Labor Secretary Julie Su to Detroit to help clinch a deal. Here with the latest, we've got Yahoo Finance senior autos reporter Pras Subramanian. So Pras, what do we know about not just the historic occasion, but where we stand in any types of negotiations now? So interesting developments here, right? So President Biden weighing in on that, saying that record record profits mean record contracts. Um, he did mention that he that he said that the the negotiations had stalled. But just got an email from the UAW talking about how uh, Sean Fain says yes, we agree with that comment about contracts and record profits. But what the negotiations haven't stalled? He says we're at the table, ready to ready to ready to negotiate. We're there. That's not what we're hearing from the big three. They're saying that we're coming to the table, and and Fain is not there. Uh, they're not negotiating in good faith is what they're saying. So there's, there's some kind of a discrepancy between what's going on here. Who knows? It could be all gamesmanship, but absolutely right. Lots of stake here. Uh, those three plants walking off today uh, and, and represent some important cars. So that's Stellantis Toledo plant there makes the Jeep Wrangler and the Gladiator pickups. That Ford uh, Michigan Detroit, uh, Ford Michigan assembly plant makes the Bronco as well as the uh, the Ranger midsize, and then that plant also in Missouri, the GM plant at, at um, Wentzville uh, makes midsize pickups and vans. So those are popular vehicles that are going to be sort of idle now. You know, if you go to the dealership lot, hopefully you have inventory there, but in a few weeks that might go away, and that's sort of the the pain point that the union wants to put on uh, the automakers. But you know, like I said, it's a it's a it's a stand up strike. They can. They can go back to work tomorrow there and then strike somewhere else. Mm. So that's sort of what the maximum leverage they want to extract or kind of put on the auto, auto, automakers right now is with this stand-up strike strategy. Uh, Pros, I mean, what, what does that stand-up strike strategy reveal in terms of how they're choosing which plants to strike? I mean, what is the strategy? I think the strategy is to go for these high leverage, uh, very important plants for the automakers. Now, these are important, but not as important as, let's say, Ford's Kansas City F-150 plant. They didn't strike there. So I think they sort of are saying, hey, we're not going to go all out here. We're going to do these sort of selective plants that are important, but not super important. The big question is, what do the automakers do, right? They can actually say, you know what? Forget this. Lock them out. They, that's a possibility. They could lock out all the workers and say, come to the table now. Let's, let's negotiate. You're going to drain your strike fund. Potent potentially that could be an option. I think right now we're in like sort of a status quo situation where the automakers will kind of see what the UAW does, try to negotiate more, try to exert some public pressure on them. We'll see what happens. But I think right now, it, it, I think we're in the, in, the, in the makings of a long strike sort of situation is what my guess is right now. All right, Pros, thanks for continuing to track this and breaking this down for us to hear to really begin the discussion around this topic. Akiko? 
Well, United Auto Workers officials initiated that walkout at just three auto plants so far as part of that strategic strike plan. 13,000 workers at Ford's Bronco plant in Detroit, a Stellantis Jeep factory in Toledo, Ohio, and a GM pickup plant in Missouri. Their posts and took uh, left their posts and took to the picket lines. Now, while the current strike plan allows for minimal pain, to the auto industry up front. If negotiations go on much longer, the strikes will expand, impacting not only the big three, but their suppliers, dealers, and of course, the overall economy. President Biden saying today that he is sending acting Labor Secretary Julie Hsu and White House Senior Advisor Gene Sperling to help with negotiations, emphasizing the huge impact that car makers have on the economy, saying, quote, auto workers helped create America's middle class, they deserve a contract that helps sustain them and the middle class. Our next guest supplies aluminum and magnesium components for GM, Ford, Stellantis, and also Tesla. He's here to give us his insight on the impact the strike will have on the industry. Let's bring in Todd Olson, Twin City Die Castings CEO. Uh, Todd, uh, let's just get to the point there. I mean, what has been the impact or what will be the impact the longer this goes on to your business? Yeah, right now with the, the strike locations that they picked, it, it actually has minimal impact to us. Uh, it, it'll be about 2% of our revenue, which, uh, you know, we'll miss a, a, a bit there, but it could be much worse. Um, a, a direct strike against all of GM would have, would have been worse for us. Um, the UAW was very intelligent the way they, they went forward with this. They, they fired a, a good warning shot out there that they're serious, that they are willing to strike all three of of the, the big three out there. And they didn't inflict maximum pain as that was referenced earlier out there. The uh, pickup truck plants would have been much worse, the full-size pickups. And actually the component plants would have even been worse because if they shut down an engine plant or a transmission plant that feeds multiple assembly plants, that can inflict maximum pain for the automotive companies and really minimize the pain to the UAW by not having a lot of their workers out on strike and, and paying strike pay. Todd, from your assessment, where does it sound, feel like the largest hangup still is? Well, I, I think the, the tough portion is going to be the, the wage increases, uh, the original ask of 46%. Um, that's a big number out there. I think that would be very difficult for the automakers to digest and remain competitive going forward. Um, they already have a, a disadvantage on wages compared to the transplants out there in Tesla. Uh, I think that would be difficult for them to make that transition into the investing into EVs and also prepare for any recessions going forward out there. So I think that number is going to be a big one. I know there's an ask out there for 32 hour work weeks with, with full pay. Um, that's going to be very difficult, but I would, I would think that would be something they could end up compromising on if they got the right wages. Todd, how are you planning for the possibility of a prolonged strike? What contingency plans do you have in place? Yes, well, for the last about six months or so, this I felt this was fairly well telegraphed uh, to the industry out there that this was a high potential to happen. Uh, the sides were fairly far apart. You saw the UAW came out fairly aggressive with their speech on, on what they wanted out there and, and weren't willing to back down. So we've laid out business plans on what we would do to react in each of the different scenarios. Um, if, if one of the big three went on strike, if they all did, all of them going on strike at once um, for the full uh, assembly lines and such, probably would be a last resort out there. The component manufacturing is, is gonna probably be a next step that they would consider or go after the pickup plants. So what we've done there is we've tried to make sure our inventories weren't extremely high going into this so we can uh, build some inventory in preparation for the next uh, couple weeks out there to kind of soften the blow to our workforce out there. You know, we're doing the, the normal things you would do from cutting down overtime, watching extra expenses. I'm spending quite a bit of time uh, communicating with our employees. Our, uh, we're an ESOP company, so we're employee owned. So it's very important for our employees to understand what's going on and, and for us to be honest and, and share with them. So right now, I think the, we'll see what happens in the next week or so. And then I, don't, I think if they make progress, this will step up and, and, and get a little more painful for people. Todd, what is the significance of the Teamsters telling their members not to cross picket lines with this strike? 
I think we've, if I remember correctly, we've seen that in the past. I think that happened in the 2019 strike against General Motors. And I assume that will be targeting uh, the transportation of vehicles um, out of the plants. So that could really be tough also. So they could potentially have vehicles sitting at the plants uh, unable to uh, be sold, but still keep their employees working. Todd, you don't just supply to the big three. As we noted in this introduction to you, you also supply to Tesla. The expectation is here the longer the strike goes on. That's one of those car makers that could benefit on the back of it. Um, what's been the conversation uh, with Tesla for, for you on that front in terms of increasing inventory? I'm wondering if you can add any color on you know, how other car makers are watching this one. Uh, well, actually, we supply to most of the, the automotive manufacturers out there, so the transplants, whether it's BMW and Honda, so uh, the non-union plants. I think there's some concern out there overall on what this could do to suppliers. The automotive industry, the, the uh, manufacturers, Ford, General Motors and such, they've had a, a, some pretty good years the last two or three years. But I don't think a lot of people realize that the, the suppliers, and I'm not just talking about our company, and the publicly held large ones, Magna, uh, companies like that, um, things haven't been quite as good because the pricing elasticity isn't there for suppliers. We get locked into long-term contracts and actually our contracts are written so our price has to go down every year. And when you have an inflationary period with uh, rising wages and costs overall, that makes it very difficult. So I think you're gonna have a lot of the automotive companies concerned about what happens to that supply base, uh, it's going to put some people out of business if this goes very long. We've been around 104 years. We've been through numerous ones of these. We're going to survive. But uh, if this goes on for uh, you know, even a couple of weeks, I think we're going to see some suppliers that are, are going to struggle quickly. Todd, at the outset, you mentioned the increase, the percentage increase that the UAW is looking for here. On the supplier side, if we were to have major automakers still have to get somewhere well above what they're currently paying, obviously, to at least e either meet in the middle of the road or give up some concessions on, on wages, what does that mean for suppliers? Even though you do have these longstanding or multi-year contracts, what does that mean at your next negotiation? Actually, that's one of the larger concerns of mine is if the automakers uh, need to cut costs out there that they will look to the suppliers to do that. So that's really where I'm, I'm concerned going forward is if uh, wages go up and and uh, they're going to look to suppliers to kind of bridge that gap for them and, and the margins on automotive suppliers aren't extremely high so there's not a lot of room to, to do that. Well, Todd, we appreciate you uh, spending the time to talk to us today. Uh, we'd love to stay in touch to see how this affects your business. Todd Olson, Twin City Diecasting CEO, good to have you on the show. Hey, thank you, and have a good afternoon. Switching gears here, shares of Arm. They are moving fractionally lower in today's trading session. The stock closed up yesterday nearly 25% in the company's first day of trading. The company's strong public debut signaling a possible revival for the IPO market after a muted year. Instacart today raised its proposed price range on the hype here. And there is plenty to be waiting for, to really kind of be sitting on the edge of your ergonomic chairs right now, Akiko, when we think about <laughs> just what these two major names could unveil or at least unleash in terms of some of the potential for companies making their way into the public markets. Because to this point, it's really just been the industrial sector, according to some data from Renaissance Capital, that's really kind of run away with the IPOs, the listings that have come forward at this point in the year. But now, tech back in focus, some household names perhaps, even uh, we got Kava. That's perhaps one of the lunch trades that had made its way to the public markets earlier this year. So we'll see what this this third and fourth quarter hold. Yeah, Brad, I mean, that's why there's been so much interest, right, on, on Arm and now Instacart, because the expectation is that if you've got two successful big debuts there, that could unlock the pipeline for a lot of these unicorns that are waiting in the wings to test the market. Now, it's interesting to note, number one, Instacart now saying they're going to be pricing on Monday, with shares expected to trade on Tuesday. You talked about the higher, uh, you know, price range that, that, that they put their shares, but that's still... 
really pales in comparison to where the company was valued at in their last private funding round, the $39 billion. So this still amounts to what would be a down round in the public markets for Instacart. Now, having said that, it's worth talking about where Arm is right now because it did get a huge boost yesterday, up more than 20 percent. You know, still questions about whether this is about the tech trade or specifically the AI trade and, mm. and the potential for ARM to play in that. And we did get Needham uh, analyst Charles Shee initiating coverage there with a hold, saying that he thinks the valuation is already too high and that ARM could struggle to expand beyond the smartphone market. So it's just something to keep keep a close watch on. But of course, some arm giving back some of their gains, but still well above where um, it started trading at yesterday. Well, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up after the break, are we due for one rate hike this year? Commerce Street Capital CEO on why he thinks there's more ahead or more work ahead for the Fed. Plus, flyer beware. Airlines are warning fuel prices could hit their bottom line in the quarter ahead what it all means for travelers ahead of the holiday season. And are student loans worth it? To wrap up our student loan week, we are speaking with two experts about the state of student debt ahead of repayments resuming in October. And we're asking, is college even worth the price tag? Those conversations on the other side. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Let's do a quick check of the market sponsored by a tasty trade. Uh, we've got uh, the Dow off of session lows, but still down more than 240 points with about 45 minutes left to go in the trading week. The S&P 500 down 49 and the Nasdaq down more than 200 points. 
points. Also taking a look at the VIX, the fear gauge, uh, seeing where that stands today on the back of some concerns, certainly around central bank policy as well. We have seen that elevated. They're up more than 8% on the day at 13.96. Well, all eyes are on the Fed's next meeting, with the market giving just a 3% chance of a rate hike happening as the Fed continues to target that 2% inflation goal. Our next guest, though, is predicting at least one more hike between now and the end of the year. Dory Wiley is Commerce Street Capital CEO and president. He joins us now. Uh, Dory, walk me through your base case. Uh, how much of this is about the reacceleration we have seen in inflation largely stemming from energy prices? Uh, you know, quite a bit. In fact, you know, I've seen a lot of people talking about, well, if we took out energy or we took out food or we took about all these things, you know, then it's actually not quite so bad. But unfortunately, as consumers, we can't do that. So it is what it is. And the energy is probably likely to worsen over the over the next uh, six to six to 12 months but due to the long term supply issues. I think we'll also see some pressure on the housing and the food inflation as well. And it's going to be difficult for the Fed to use that as a gauge monitor on the economy because there's still a lot of inflation pressure there. Dory, how would you describe the state of the consumer then right now, considering some of the confidence data that we've seen come out this week, retail sales data, all of these different purchase decisions that consumers have to wade through right now? You know, you bring up an excellent point because we're getting confused, confused data, right? Or confusing data, you know, uh, the inflation still remains, you know, above the target, but unemployment remains strong. The consumer spending remains strong. Uh, equity fund inflows into the market are highest in three months. Um, uh, the uh, earnings are kind of remaining strong and people are adjusting down S&P earnings, but tech still remains very strong. The VIX, even though it's up today, is still way below uh, kind of kind of where a red red or even an average, right? It's it's a risk on according to the VIX and GDP forecast on GDP now is is still high at five point six percent. So the consumer's kind of hanging in there, but it doesn't mean that the pressure is not building. Pressure on higher interest rates, pressure on personal debt, pressure on uh, consumer debt, pressure on on corporate debt. All of these things are building, particularly in the real estate space, to uh, kind of create some lingering issues going forward. And I think the Fed's going to have to raise rates again before year end. Also want to talk with you about oil. We're watching oil after it hit 10-month highs after stronger than expected data out of China. Now, industrial production and, and retail sales jumping above expectations. We were discussing the retail sales part of that in the world's second largest economy, though, separately here uh, as, as we think about that. What should investors expect from the energy sector moving forward? I think if you look at, you know, energy is extremely difficult <laughs> to, to forecast, but we have long-term supply issues that are still, uh, at, at, uh, you know, built up into the market. So I really do think uh, you just almost have to be bullish over the next two to three to five years. Uh, Short-term is always difficult to, to forecast, but the what's kept uh, oil prices down has been the expectation of a recession that hasn't shown up. Right. And so this decrease in demand for oil that was supposed to offset these long term supply issues just has not materialized. So is your expectation that, uh, you know, OPEC plus maintains these supply cuts or, or you think that sort of the, the, the demand picture really becomes the driver in the months ahead, uh, particularly um, considering what's happening in China? The long-term driver is the supply side. The short-term driver is demand, right? Because that's anticipating uh, what what the market's going to do. But I think the market's kind of had it wrong in that uh, it's overestimated a demand problem that really hasn't manifested itself. So I think you'll continue to see oil, oil, oil rise uh, above the $100 barrel range. And then... As we're taking a look at WTI and Brent here on the screen for our viewers here, if, if, if that does rive above the $100 a barrel range, how does that trickle through to the consumer and their purchase decisions and not just, you know, how much they've already had to weather over the course of 2022? I mean, it kind of places us back into that same mind frame, but at a time where they're already perhaps bending, not necessarily breaking, even in some of the necessities purchases as well. 
Well, it's got to affect them, right? I mean, cars are expensive. Gas is expensive. Not everyone can afford it. Uh, if you live in California where the gas is twice as expensive as it is, ever, you know, that's got to slow you down. It's got to hurt that economy. So uh, uh, I just I think it's going to be a negative effect on uh, a lot of part of the country and the consumer. And it'll add to the pressure that they're already under. Uh, and, and the Fed's done a good job. People haven't given them enough credit. They've been trying to engineer a soft landing. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how the economy is, is hung in there. And the consumer particularly is hung in there with 500 basis point rate hike uh, to stop and breathe uh, next week, which they probably will, uh, given, given the odds that are in the market right now. That's fine. But, uh, you know, with, with all the positive things about them hanging in there, I could see them raising rates you know, maybe one more time before year end. Is this the is this the reminder that consumers needed, though, that the Fed does not control energy, does not control oil, but still has to try and figure out and, and maneuver and run the calculus for some type of soft landing? Well, you bring up a really good thing. People like to get mad at the Fed. You know, hey, they're causing a recession and this, that, and the other. No, they're just a small cog in the wheel here trying to influence the market. You know, uh, they'd be better off getting mad at Congress for spending all that money, which the Fed can't control, right? That's the, that's where a lot of inflationary pressure comes from. They're just doing their best to try to deal with the data that they, they have and to uh, engineer a soft landing. So there's no reason to be mad at the Fed. Uh, but the uh, the consumer's done a pretty good job. I've just been amazed at how resilient it was. I, I thought we'd have more pressure on the market uh, the, coming into this end of this year. But, uh, you know, looking at the VIX, it's a risk on. And uh, the GDP forecast, now the, the Atlanta GDP was above six uh, forecast, and now it's down to 5.6. It may come down a little bit more, but that's still a very strong GDP growth number. Yeah, it's certainly a bullish outlook there. All right, let's talk strategy. Uh, you've got the S&P 500 wiping out its gains this week, taking a look at where the NASDAQ is. We've seen some big declines on that front. Um, you've got one particular tech play that you think is undervalued. What are you looking at? You know, interestingly, you know, uh, tech's really difficult because it gets overbought. And of course, it, it sold off earlier this year and it's had a wonderful rally this year. And the Earnings cuts on tech are not as strong as they are in the rest of the S&P, which is starting to weaken. And so looking for value in the tech space is actually quite difficult. But I do think there is some value. Uh, if you look over there at microchip technology, uh, they, uh, they've got some good growth. they got a good position in the industry. Uh, and, and they're undervalued, not only compared to their peers, but undervalued, undervalued compared to uh, you know, where they've been recently. So I, I think it's a good good chance to build it. Now, the sector is pretty good. You know, you want to play AI and jump into, you know, corrections uh, with NVIDIA or, you know, Microsoft's always a good stock or some things like that. I, I think that makes some sense. It's just hard to find the right time to buy in. So anytime there's dips, I think that makes some sense. But I, I like this microchip technology company and their position, and, and it looks a little more, um, uh, cheap, if you will, <laughs> compared to the rest of them. All right. Haven't seen a proponent of Bowtie Friday in a while. Dory, you're, you're making not just a fashion statement, but some market statements out here today. We're making a comeback. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. I got, I got to find mine in the closet somewhere. We appreciate the time here today. Dory Wiley, Commerce Street Capital CEO and President. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks. Well, shares of Planet Fitness, they are lower by 14% after a leadership shakeup. The company ousting its CEO, Chris Rondeau, after 10 years at the helm. Board member and Planet Fitness franchisee Craig Benson will take over as interim CEO. Akiko, this was a wild one to see come through in this announcement earlier today and during the trading session. And particularly here, what our viewers will remember is that Chris Rondeau has been in this position the entirety of this company's publicly traded lifespan. So all of these different movements that we've seen in the stock, the communication has come from Chris Rondeau, his team, and the, the question largely looms of, okay, we've got an interim CEO, but, but who is next to run this company? Yeah, I mean, no real succession plan that was in place there, but you know, to your point, Chris Rondeau has been CEO since 2013, but he's been with the company since 1993 wow. when he joined 
in that first location for the company working on the front desk. So, I mean, he's in many ways synonymous with Planet Fitness itself, which is why we saw such a big reaction. Number one, completely unexpected. And number two, just given that he is the guy that has steered the company. Now, if you look at the overall fitness space, and Brad, I know you watch this one really closely. I mean, you could argue in many ways they have been the beneficiaries of what has been over the last several years, sort of this return to the gym. But um, you've got to wonder where the company is going to go without that next CEO in place. How shaky that transition is going to be, um, given that this this kind of was not, at least from an investor perspective, uh, expected. Right. And one of the great things about having interviewed Chris Rondeau, particularly here on Yahoo Finance, almost quarter after quarter, is that we got insight into what his relationships and the company's relationships more broadly were like with their franchisees and how they were moving forward into different regions, what those setup processes were like, and how Planet Fitness was essentially this marketing engine that franchisees could lean onto and have this stable pricing strategy that they were able to communicate in any region that they entered into. And that stable pricing strategy, also for a consumer right now that is trying to figure out, all right, where am I spending into certain services or experiences, that is beneficial. However, year to date hasn't been. It's down by about 35%. So we'll see what further statements come at this point, Akiko. And worth noting that uh, Chris Rondo will continue to serve on the company's board. Well, coming up, airlines are warning sky high fuel prices will sap margins in the second quarter. But what this means for investors and travelers, more next. More than $2 trillion in stock options are set to expire today, this Friday evening. So what does it mean for investors? Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange to make sense of it all for us. Jared. 
Let's make some sense here. Uh, it is OPEX day. It's actually the highest volume OPEX day, at least in terms of the options that are expiring ever to have occurred in September, the sixth highest ever. And uh, all this does is provide a little bit of liquidity in the market. Uh, but I want to go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. I've, already, I've actually charted what usually happens to stocks overall, the S&P 500, on these option expiration days. So this goes back to 2015, and in Cyan, we have the SPY, which tracks the S&P 500. Here we are at about 450. And then this here tracks what happens on OPEX days. You can see it's from the upper left to the lower right, except that we've kind of flatlined this year. Uh, but true to uh, history here, we are going down on options expiration date. And we got to talk about the VIX if we're talking options, because we just hit the lowest print of the year, 13 and change today. This is a three month chart. If I were to show you a year to date, you would see, there you go. It is the lowest of the year. And yet we are up off of that print. So nothing to uh, write home about yet, but something we're going to be watching next week because guess what? This is prime time crash season, September, October. This is when the VIX tends to spike. Just taking another look at the Wi-Fi Interactive, these purple bars are what usually happens. And in September, I'm circling that now. And in October, we get those big uh, spikes up and that's what happens on average. Doesn't have to happen, uh, but if it did this year, we'd probably see that with a bit of a downdraft in equity. So just kind of being mindful of that, we're also taking a look at bonds this week. Uh, the 10-year T-note yield up just a little bit. Here's the year-to-date look. I'm gonna change this to a three-month and you can see up near these highs that we had in the month of August. And when we have the 10-year T-note surging, guess what? Tech take tends to take a backseat. If we look at the five days of price action this week in the S&P 500 sectors, guess what? XLK is dead last. That's down 2.2%. So kind of a backseat. We haven't seen tech really be the laggard this much uh, since earlier in the year when we were talking about mega cap outperformance. So I think next week is going to be very interesting, especially Wednesday when we have that big Fed meeting, watching bonds and also stock reactions to that. Guys. Yeah, things always get interesting in a Fed meeting, right? I'll be here. Weeks when we have the Fed meeting. Jared's going to be yeah. on the floor for us. All right, thanks for that, Jared. Have a good weekend. You too. Well, airline stocks hitting some turbulence with several major airlines cutting guidance in recent weeks, largely due to higher jet fuel costs. American Airlines now expects third quarter earnings of 20 cents and 30 cents per share. That's sharply lower than its previous estimate of around 85 cents to 95 cents a share. Low cost carrier Spirit now sees revenue between $1.24 billion and $1.25 billion in the third quarter. Southwest, United Airlines, and Alaska all issuing new guidance on how much they're expecting to spend on jet fuel. Joining us now, we've got Peter McNally, Third Bridge Global Sector Lead for Industrials, Materials, and Energy. Peter, great to speak with you as always here. If, if I may summon back into the chat Southwest specifically here, because I, I think they gave a warning that was a little bit more telling about the consumer, especially on that low end here. Here. How much of a warning shot was that to the state of this kind of travel resurgence that many of these CEOs had said is locked in place, is good to go, we are in a countercyclical recovery on that front? Well, there's a few things going on here, you know, in, in the industry. One, I think we've seen in particular this summer, there's been a shift to international. People have been traveling traveling domestically for a few years now since uh, since the recovery. And that's where we think we've seen the outperformance in major airlines like United, Delta, and American on, on their top line serving, you know, serving those customers. But costs, you know, as well is uh, is one more factor. And then the third thing that we haven't seen really in four years is capacity. And more planes are being put into service. Uh, airlines have been aggressive in ordering. And finally, Boeing and Airbus are getting their supply chains together. These planes are being delivered. There's more supply of seats. And that's putting some downward pressure on fares here. And we're going into a seasonally softer period for demand. So, um, you know, this is going to be the state of play, we think, for uh, for the next few months in the industry. Yeah, Peter, you know, I'm thinking back to last year when we saw really energy sp uh, prices spike in a big way on the back of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, airlines did raise their prices, and yet there was this continued demand from consumers who were in the middle of what we characterize as revenge travel. Um, is the, is, do airlines have that same pricing power this time around, even as they see their own costs add up? Because consumers, as you point out, aren't in the same place. 
No, it's different now. Um, the the situation has eroded with these additional aircrafts that are that are coming in into service. And yes, fares have gotten high, you know, you know for sure. And and people do want to travel. We wouldn't we wouldn't argue that. And you know, we are through at least on the leisure side in terms of passenger numbers where we were in in 2019. Business still has a way to go and. So does international, but uh, airlines have less pricing power now than they do uh, at any point since since the recovery began. You mentioned something really interesting in, in why customers continue to book and, and that it's interactional. If more of the bookings are for an interna interactional, excuse me, purpose, mm -hmm. then does that lead to a, a kind of leisure malaise here? People who are just kind of booking travel for the sake of the experience of it all. Well, look, I mean, there's always a few, you know, things to consider here, but I, I think, you know, what one thing that should not be underestimated in this is that airlines, you know, still don't have change fees. So it's allowing people to book and then have a lot more flexibility on when and where they go. Uh, and I think what we were seeing earlier this year was people just booking to make sure that they got a seat you know, frankly. And, um, you know, now at this point, like there are more seats available made, you know, made available by these airlines with these new craft aircraft and they paid their labor, you know, whether it's pilots, um, you know, flight attendants, you know, more money uh, to get these planes in the air. But I think that's uh, kind of the key part of the dynamic now. To what extent has, um, the, the rough experience is probably putting it mildly, you know, what we've seen in the summer, Airlines being canceled, the constant delays. I mean, how, how has that been eating into not just the experience, but also this this travel demand? I mean, have you seen a dent on the back of it? Maybe I'm just speaking from personal experience here, but it is, <laughs> it, it, you know, you have to wonder how frustrating it is um, to have to, to to go through sort of repeatedly. And the airlines, as well as the Department of Transportation, has made, made it very clear there is a rough patch that's happening right now, partly because of staffing, um, yeah. but partly because of other factors as well. It's It's been frustrating for sure, but people keep coming back. Um, our experts would argue this summer that the disruptions really were weather driven. You know, United was the big one this time, but if we roll back to last Christmas, you know, the Southwest debacle was pretty much self-inflicted. It was an IT system that, you know, melted down. It's been something that's kind of plagued the the company for years um that our experts would you know have been citing you know prior to that it had been getting pilots you know paid enough and trained you know to fly these things but lately it's been more about weather um this could you know this could change as demand continues to grow but people come back and look driving isn't that cheap and flying can get you there like pretty quick but um you know, the underlying demand is still there. All right, Peter, we got to leave things there. Of course, we could continue to talk to you all day about this. Third Bridge Global Sector Lead for Industrials, Thanks. Materials, and Energy. Peter, have a great weekend. You too. Take care. Thanks. Well, Disney is reportedly getting a big bid on some of its broadcast networks. We'll share the details on the other side of the break.
Disney may be getting a big offer for ABC. Byron Allen has reportedly put up a $10 billion bid for the network, along with the FX and National Geographic, according to Bloomberg. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal joins us with the details. Hey, Alex. Hey, Brad. Yeah, so a $10 billion bid from Allen, reportedly. On top of that, you have Nexstar Media, Media Group being another reported potential buyer for these linear networks. Now, it's important to note that these are exploratory talks, so nothing has been set in stone just yet. Disney did respond to the reports, writing in a statement, quote, while we are open to considering a variety of strategic options for our linear businesses, at this time, the Walt Disney Company has made no decision with respect to the divestiture of ABC or any other property, and any report to that effect is unfounded. But overall, this does represent how serious Bob Iger is about potentially selling off the linear networks. He said before that linear may no longer be core to Disney's business moving forward. We also heard from Nexstar earlier this week at a Media conference, the company did express its interest to potentially purchase some of those assets from Disney, although they did say that any deal moving forward will be complicated, especially if ESPN is not included in that spinoff since ESPN and ABC both share some of those telecasts. And then on top of that, you know, at the end of the day, Linear is still a profitable, high margin business. It does fund a lot of the growth initiatives that Disney has been tackling, like streaming. So there's that tricky balance between appreciating the cash flow that Linear provides while also understanding that we're in a big secular de de decline right now as more Americans cut the cord in favor of those less profitable streaming services. So overall, yet another example of just the complexities within the Linear bundle, and it comes on the heels of that charter agreement that they right. met earlier this week. So a lot going on at Disney right now. Yeah. So Ali, what is Disney's future on broadcast TV? That's the big question, and there's a lot of unknowns right now. CEO Bob Iger said during the latest earnings call that the company is going to focus on three main growth areas. That's the film business, the parks business, and the streaming business. So linear networks, nowhere near included in that. And yes, we have these early stage talks reportedly with Byron Allen and Nexstar Media. However, analysts have long questioned who will be the buyer of these businesses, especially amid those uh, cord cutting the clients that I've been talking about. And this is something that le legacy media, in addition to Disney, is facing overall. Uh, Comcast NBC, Paramount CBS, Fox Corporation. Uh, according to a recent data from Nielsen, linear TV viewership fell below 50% in July for the very first time, while time spent streaming via a television continued to increase. And then you have those advertising woes that just keep mounting for these various companies. And then, interestingly enough, I took a look at the market cap of Netflix, which is currently hovering right above $175 billion. That roughly equals the market caps of Disney, Fox, and Paramount combined. So investors seem to be putting their weight behind streaming services right now. Yeah, absolutely. Ali, thanks for tracking this, breaking this down for us. We'll see if a deal gets finalized. We'll see. We'll see. All right, guys. Akiko? Well, high prices continue to squeeze prospective home buyers. A new report from Realtor.com shows the lack of affordability as the number one reason buyers are staying on the sidelines. Other reasons include affordable home availability. We're talking about inventory. They're saving for a down payment and getting approved for a mortgage. We're going to get some updates on the housing market next week with Housing starts, builder confidence, and existing home sales data coming out. Joining us now is chief economist for Realtor.com. Danielle Hale. Um, Danielle, it, it feels like there's not a lot of relief in sight every time we talk to you, but where do things stand right now? I mean, we're talking about the first time home buyer really being squeezed. Those rates are near 8% now. Yeah, home buying costs are uh, very, very high right now. They've essentially doubled in the last three years. So it is a challenging time to be a home buyer, especially if you're a first time home buyer and don't have the benefit of seeing your uh, your prior home go up in price and build up some equity that you can leverage in a transaction. So um, first time home buyers are challenged by the market. At the same time, existing homeowners are challenged by the market because they are sitting on very low mortgage rates, uh, in many cases under 4% or even under 3% in some cases, uh, and market rates are up well above 7%. So trading uh, up for those homeowners is an expensive proposition. And so the market is seeing not a lot of activity right now. Existing home sales continue to be quite low. 
Um, and there's not a lot for sale because those that mortgage rate lock-in effect is really hampering homeowners, keeping them on the sidelines. That's creating some opportunities for builders, but all in all, housing market activity on the whole remains quite low. What type of overflow is that continuing to have within rents right now? Yeah, so interestingly, I talk about you know builders doing a little bit better than the existing home sales market. So we are seeing some people who might have bought existing homes look at the new market just because they're not finding what they want. At the same time, builders are building a lot of multifamily homes. Those are typically marketed for rent. So a lot of multifamily supply is coming on the on the way, and it's hitting the market as an at an interesting time. Our recent rental data has shown that. Rents have declined on a year-over-year -year basis for the past three months. We've got new rental data coming out next week. So uh, you know, we'll look to see if that trend continues. That's spelling relief for renters, but it's also indicating some more competition for landlords is on the way as more supply is coming online when rents are already softening. Danielle, going back to home buying, what's the rate you think at which it makes sense for a homeowner to say, okay, maybe I'll consider testing the market? We're not getting back to 3% think, anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, no. So I, I think trying to beat their existing mortgage for many homeowners is just not going to be possible. You're not going to get a lower rate anytime soon. So it's going to be a different consideration for every single household. And, and they're going to have to think about their personal situation, how good of a fit their current home is, or how much more they need that additional space. If you've got a job change, you might have to move anyway. If you've got more kids on the way, you might have to move anyway. So there are family situations that are going to drive housing changes. Um, I think the other thing people want to look at is their equity position. Do they have enough equity to roll into a new home so that maybe the sting of a higher mortgage rate is less impactful because they can put down a lot of equity and take on a very small mortgage, or in some cases, you know, homeowners who have 100% equity don't need a mortgage at all. You know, they can be freed up to take advantage of a market that is much less competitive than it has been over the past couple of years. If we do indeed see an inkling of a rate cut next year, um, or at least, you know, some tenor shift in the Fed that they're considering multiple cuts even, what would that do for the housing market? And would that mean that the prospect is largely changed for a lot of people? We see an overflow of new buyers and, and potentially sellers as well. So I do think there is some pent up demand in the housing market. High rates are keeping a lot of people on the sidelines for affordability uh, or for holding on to their existing low rate. I don't think we're going to see rates dip low enough to see a flood of homes onto the market. But I think as rates gradually drift lower, those individual calculations of should I move now or should I stay put will make sense for more and more people. Because as it takes time for those rates to drift lower, those current homeowners are building up more equity in their houses and are having more life changes that are likely to drive uh, the need to move into a different housing situation. So I think we're going to see a gradual recovery in the housing market as those rates drift lower. And the point at which people acclimate, you know, the longer it takes, the more they're going to get used to those higher rates. But I think for buyers in the market today, it's worth thinking about the fact that you can't control mortgage rates. And if you've been shopping over the past year, that's a very real reality to you. Um, but there is yeah. something that buyers should know that they can take advantage of. And that's we have these seasonal patterns in the housing market of supply and demand and ebbs and flows. And they kind of are looking to shape up so that the first week of October, October 1st through 7th, is actually the best time of the year from a seasonal perspective for buyers to buy. That's interesting. That's in a few weeks. Um, you know, we, we talk about rates not being the only factor for first time home buyers. There's also the hurdle of getting a, a, you know, a mortgage approved, but also having that down payment. Given the tight conditions right now, I'm just curious, what are you seeing in the market? Are, are, are buyers putting down 20%? Is it more likely 15%? I mean, how are buyers getting a little more creative so that they can get that home, that condo in hand? Yeah, so first time home buyers have, have never traditionally put down 20%. They tend to put down lower down payments amount. And that makes sense because they're usually, you know, this is their first home purchase. They're usually younger. They don't have as much savings built up over a lifetime. The high mortgage rate environment makes it challenging because the bigger the down payment you can put down, the lower your monthly costs are going to be. 
but obviously it takes time to amass that down payment. And especially in an environment where rents have been high, it's challenging to save up. So home buyers are getting creative. They're, they're looking to different types of savings uh, to come up with down payments. In some cases, moving in with friends or family to save up for a down payment. And you know, something that we've seen and continue to see in the housing market is people who are interested in looking for homes beyond their current location. Uh, and oftentimes they're looking at other more affordable locations. So if you live in a high cost area like New York, for example, you might look further out into the suburbs, or if you have the flexibility to work remotely, which some workers still have, you might look to a different market that's much more affordable entirely. And that's another way that the buyers are getting creative when approaching the housing market. Still points to a lot of challenges ahead. Danielle Hale, Chief Economist for Realtor.com. Good to talk to you. Have a good weekend. You too. Well, coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're going to check in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. You're listening in to the closing bell on Wall Street. 
Let's do a quick check of the markets as the clock is officially struck 4 p.m. Eastern time. Taking a look at the Dow, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq make it stop. We see some red across the board here. Let's run through it real quick. This is sponsored by Tasty Trade. This market check, the Dow is down by about eight tenths of a percent. Ends the day there lower by 288 points. S&P 500 ends the day with losses of about 1.2 percent. And the Nasdaq tech heavy average ends the day in the red by one and a half percent, about 1.6 percent if you're rounding up at home and really want to layer it on. But red across the board to end the day, Akiko. Okay, Brad, let's talk about some of the stocks that we've been watching closely throughout the day. Salesforce down nearly 2 percent today. Bloomberg reporting the cloud-based software firm is hiring 3,300 people across various departments. A change of tone from the company Earlier this year, remember, they eliminated 10 percent of its workforce. And Brad, you know, as soon as I saw this, thinking back to the conversations that our very own Brian Sazi had out at Dreamforce, how many times did he talk about those boomerang employees, those employees that were maybe laid off earlier on the year, maybe left the company last year? Uh, Salesforce really making an effort to try and bring those employees back, largely because they see opportunities um, in huge expansion. AI is certainly a big one, but they've also talked about sales, engineering. Um, so uh, Salesforce sees a lot of opportunities there. Interesting stock move, although you know we've often seen the hiring correlated with a, a leg down in terms of the stock because of the costs associated with that. Yeah, with some of the major ambitions that they laid out at Dreamforce this week that, as you mentioned, our own executive editor, Brian Sazi, was hearing directly from, if you will, the horse's mouth, but uh, will be more kind and generous and say the, the genius, the leader that is Mark Benioff as well, uh, the CEO of Salesforce, as well as some of the CEOs of subsidiaries within there, um, at Slack, particularly, and Slack came up in the conversation, in the chat, as one of the leading plays that Salesforce would have in AI. They said that Slack would really kind of lead that charge among some of their tools and application services that they offer out to their portfolio clients. But for where Salesforce is also going to look to expand here, it's in partnerships. They're expanding through a partnership that they already have with Google to deliver this new era that they're calling of business productivity powered by generative AI. So a larger kind of indication of where we've already seen some of the mega cap tech companies decide how they're going to carve out their space through partnerships to maintain their own kind of market share, even as this new wave of, of generative AI investments has accelerated, had lighter fluid essentially pouring on it over the past several quarters here, and, and especially over the course of this year. All right, let's move on to another stock we're watching, DoorDash. Uh, seeing, let's see where the stock ended. There you go, down about 2.5%. So Moffat Nathanson, analyst downgrading DoorDash from outperform to market perform, citing the return of student loan payments to take a bite out of their revenue. Uh, a number, uh, DoorDash also announcing it's transferring its listing from the New York Stock Exchange to the NASDAQ. They will officially make the move on September 27th. Uh, Brad, uh, worth noting some numbers in this report. The average student loan uh, consumer is about to experience a 14 to 19 percent hit to discretionary spending. And of course, you know, DoorDash isn't the only company that's going to get hit. We've heard sort of the impact from student loan repayments uh, from other companies throughout earnings calls. But this line here, what happens when 43 million Americans see an average of $225 a month come out of their pockets in October? This is from that Moffat Nathanson report. Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? And when you think about the user base for DoorDash, Monthly active users age 25 to 44, 65% of those users all fall within that age group. And those are likely to take the biggest hit when those uh, uh, student uh, loan repayments resume in October. Yeah, so layer on that DoorDash usership figure that you mentioned there and, and the demographic that they go after and the core user base that really accounts for much of the activity with this federal data that the analysts also had layered in here. People aged 24 to 49 hold 69 percent of the nation's student loan debt. So you kind of combine these two things together and it really spells out a discretionary food spending storm that is brewing at this point in time and, and is set to hit the coast of DoorDash and perhaps some of the other delivery businesses here. We're looking at Chew Uber. We're looking, you know, uh, of course, across the, the broader spectrum of these services that have really 
really made sure that they can continue to uh, attract mindshare on not just the convenience factor, but also making sure that they're growing out the amount of merchants that they work with as well. So the amount of cuisines, the amount of kind of large national partnerships that they're able to bring on. Uh, that's something that they've used as a selling point, but what now? And so we'll see uh, exactly how that affects in, in terms of the student loan repayments, the number of people that are hop, skipping, jumping, or just kind of loading up the app as, as I do uh, when I get bored and also just, you know, when I'm lazy. And I just ordered cook. my lunch from DoorDash today. Did you? Okay. I did. All right. I did. Slide us some do racks. for the show. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about Taiwan Semiconductor here as well. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company ends the day down by 2.4%. This is the world's largest third-party semiconductor manufacturer, telling its major suppliers to delay deliveries amid slowing demand. That's according to a Reuters report here. This comes just a week after the company said its August revenue fell 13.5% from last year, just briefly as well here, um, according to the report, companies affected by the instruction um, to delay supplier shipments into uh, into Taiwan Semiconductor, it includes ASML, that's the lith uh, lithography equipment that is necessary for some of the chip making, the high-end chip making, uh, according to sources within this story as well. So it wasn't just TSMC um, hit by this today. Uh, a number of their other competitors as well, um, that st those stocks moving a leg lower. But it, it, I think it's kind of interesting that the contrast with what we're hearing from um, Wall Street analysts in terms of what this all means. Uh, cities analysts saying this is no new news. Um, they said any pullback in the chip equipment subsector or, or the sector uh, would be a buying opportunity. Um, you had Jeffries analysts saying that you know they they still um, have some of these um, chip makers, uh, chip equipment suppliers as well as their top picks. So while we are seeing that pullback today, um, certainly that the long term. Um, investment case, at least among some Wall Street analysts, appear to be holding steady. Yeah, great point there. Well, a tough week for President Joe Biden here. House Republicans opening an impeachment inquiry against the president and Republicans saying that the president profited off of his son, Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings while he was vice president. And Hunter Biden was indicted this week on federal gun charges. Many are left wondering, is this impeachment inquiry going to actually affect the election or is it just a political stunt? Now who finance senior columnist Rick Newman here with more. So Rick, that 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 is the major question. Is it actually going to move the dial one way or the other? Well, I can say definitively the so-called impeachment inquiry is a political stunt. They are hoping to tar President Biden uh, reputationally, but there's no evidence that um, Biden has done anything impeachable. Um, basically, they're saying, let's file some charges and worry about the evidence later. Um, now, this gets to uh, his interactions with his son, Hunter Biden, obviously. Um, three major developments this week that are not impeachment related. And one of them is that Hunter Biden has actually been charged, criminally charged by prosecutors, with one count of lying on a form about registering a gun. He said uh, he checked a box that says that said, are you uh, check here if you are not using illegal drugs? He was using illegal drugs, but he said on that form that he wasn't. So he's been charged. Uh, with that criminally, he might also get charged for tax evasion on two other uh, two other charges. Um, this really only matters politically if um, there's any evidence, if this whole thing turns up any evidence that Joe Biden himself, the president, at, knew about, benefited, or helped his son uh, commit these what uh, may turn out to be crimes. They're relatively small crimes, we should point out. Um, but so far, there's no evidence that he did. And if the, if nothing else comes to light, and this is this investi investigation has been going on for five years back to the Trump administration, so far there's nothing, and there will probably will end up being nothing. So probably not that big a deal for President Biden. Meanwhile, two other things that are a big deal for him: this UAW strike is is a big deal for Biden. He claims to be the most pro-union president in American history, so he basically is siding with the striking workers. This is going to go for a long time, and we'll see how the public feels about this one month or two months or three months in. And we got more worrisome uh, inflation news this week. Inflation creeping back up, and we know energy is the main problem there, including gasoline prices. So there are um, dark clouds developing for Biden. The impeachment inquiry is not one of them. 
All right. Yahoo Finance reporter Rick Newman. Rick, thanks so much for breaking all of those down for us. A lot of stories that uh, we're continuing to track here on that front. Coming up, everyone, cyber attacks crippling Las Vegas casinos. We've got the latest on MGM system shutdown. Stay tuned. Shares of MGM Resorts closing lower today as the casino giant battles a widespread system outage five days after a cyber attack forced it to shut down systems at properties across the U.S. Guests reporting ATMs, slot machines, and digital room key cards remained out of order. This is Caesars Entertainment reported it was hit by a cyber attack last week that saw the personal data of its reward members compromised. The company acknowledged in an SEC filing that it couldn't guarantee the security of stolen information, putting millions at risk. With more on the potential fallout from these attacks, we've got Alan Liska, a threat security analyst at cybersecurity firm Recorded Future here. Alan, the significance here of all three of these, or at least Caesars and MGM, uh, being targeted in this fashion. Yeah, it's fairly significant. Um, Casinos have been hit a number of times this year. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, multiple attacks against them, but nothing this big. And so having these kind of huge casinos being impacted, and not just the casinos, but as you pointed out, all of their clients and uh, customers being impacted is huge. I mean, six terabytes worth of data is what is being reported out in terms of information that was stolen. What does this tell you about the security that's in place at these casinos where, I mean, everything from your room key to your transaction, your winnings, all of that is operated under this digital umbrella? Right. So casinos have traditionally invested very heavily in physical security, right? They, they want to make sure that their slot machines are safe. They want to make sure that nobody's card counting, that nobody can break into the system. They haven't invested as heavily in cybersecurity, but as we're finding out, so much of these casinos are network-based, right? Uh, the, the, as you say, the, the rooms, the slot machines, all of your credit card information, all of your membership information is all stored digitally. And that's ripe for these kind of attacks and can be incredibly devastating to not only the patrons of the casino, but to the casino themselves. So what type of hit on customer confidence does this typically have after after a cybersecurity breach like this? 
It, it depends. I mean, you saw the stock price, um, you know, for both casinos has been down this week. Uh, so there is an investor confidence issue. Um, but then there's also a confidence issue in terms of the casino themselves. Is it safe to go back there? Now, the good news is when an attack like this happens, there's almost always a heavy investment in security. So undoubtedly, both Caesars and MGM will be much more secure going forward. Um, but they may have lost confidence in their um, you know, uh, the confidence of their customers. And honestly, um, it also probably means that the other casinos on the Strip are now heavily investing in cybersecurity as well to make sure that they don't fall victim. Hey, Ellen, I wonder what you make of the reports of how this, in fact, was carried out, that this was actually information that was obtained by a phone call, not necessarily, right? I mean, hackers were able to use that information from the call to hack into the system, but it wasn't all just done on the internet. And, and I ask that because there's certainly a lot of education among companies across the country that have been put into letting employees know about what to look out for um, when there are criminals who are trying to hack into a system. I mean, this doesn't feel like it was that high tech. Most attacks aren't. Whether you're talking about a phishing attack over email, most of them aren't that complex to get in. And even most exploitations aren't that complex. That's kind of one of the dirty secrets of security is too many things are missed. In this case, social engineering, when done well, um, can be really hard to defend against. Uh, just a couple of weeks before these attacks, at the DEF CON conference in Las Vegas, they had a whole social engineering village where they were showing how easy it is to use social engineering to gain access. Because with the right script, the right voice, the right attitude, it is surprisingly easy to get help desk people to reset a password or to give you a, a multi-factor authentication code. And that's where a lot of organizations don't extend the training to. They, they'll do phishing training, they'll do security awareness training, but they won't necessarily do social engineering training. Where, where are we hearing generative AI could be perhaps one of the larger solutions for cybersecurity? Is that, I mean, obviously it's coming up in the industry, but it, it's, a, it's a matter of at, at what cost for corporations are they going to have to kind of just make sure that they put up the dollars in order to not just have an added layer of cybersecurity, but they're also being proactive within that measure as well? Right. Well, and that's the, the thing with generative AI that you need to think about is it's not just a implement it and forget it kind of solution. There's a lot of care and feeding that goes into an AI based solution to improve it and have it constantly be responsive to new threats and new kinds of attacks. And so just like with anything else in security, AI can be really helpful, but you have to have the staff, the resources and the capabilities to manage it and maintain it. Otherwise, it's just another tool sitting on your shelf not being useful. But it can be very helpful in improving cybersecurity within an organization. And finally, Alan, what about those users um, who were in Vegas who are worried maybe their data has been targeted, maybe their data has been compromised? What are the steps they should be taking right now? You know, unfortunately, we have this conversation a lot, whether we're talking about schools that are hit with ransomware, hospitals that are hit with ransomware, or now casinos that are hit with ransomware. It's the same conversation repeatedly that credit monitoring becomes really, really important here, uh, making sure that you um, are aware of any changes to your credit score, anybody trying to open new accounts, anybody trying to open new driver's license, et cetera. So having those credit monitoring services are, are really helpful. I wish I had a better answer than that, but that right now is the best solution that we have for these kind of attacks. Well, one of the reasons that we also see the stock price move in, in reaction to something like that is not just the original exposure, but also the action that customers might take on the other side. Are, are you expecting you know, some some type of massive settlements in order to assuage um, customers who are impacted by this as, as a result of, and perhaps and are brewing up a, a class action lawsuit. Yeah, so anytime we see a big ransomware attack like this, especially one that's in the news, you have two, at least two lawsuits that are filed. You'll have the shareholder 
class action lawsuit, and you also have the uh, impacted customers class action lawsuit. So yeah, we expect to see both of those um, uh, come forward in the next few weeks um, as things start to settle within MGM and within Caesars. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, that, that's just par for the course at this point. All right, Alan, thanks so much for your time and your insights on this matter. Of course, a story that we're going to be continuing to track in the falling action of it as well here. Alan Liska, appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Let's do a quick check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. Uh, a red to uh, round out the trading week with the Dow down 288 points, the S&P 500 down 54. And the NASDAQ seeing the biggest losses on the t day with a tech the sector down nearly 2% right now. We've also been watching energy um, as we see those oil prices hold above $90 a barrel. Well, is college even worth the price tag? We're gonna speak with two experts about the state of student debt coming up on the other side. We'll be right back. I am here with Josh Lipton. He is our new anchor, and he's here with three things that you need to know. First of all, tell us how you got into the reporting game. Because of Aunt Rhoda. She was a, just a battle-tested veteran news executive. I used to always have the cigarette in one hand, the, the glass of Jack Daniels in the other. <laughs> Very old school. And after college, I was kind of bouncing around, and Aunt Rhoda said, I think you should try journalism. And that was it. And you listened to Aunt Rhoda. I always listen to Rhoda. What is, has been the favorite story in finance that you've covered? Probably covering Apple. 
You know, I first got out to San Francisco. I never covered tech before. And CEO Tim Cook said, you know, let's talk about earnings. This was a big deal, and it was just fun to talk to Cook. I think he actually genuinely enjoys himself, which as we both know, not every CEO always does. NFL season yeah. kicked off. Do you have a team? I am, as you know, Julie, I'm Bay Area born and raised. So 49ers, and I look forward to the Niners beating the Eagles and upsetting Brad Smith. I think that'll be a really nice entry into Yahoo Finance. Do you have a favorite food? As you know, I'm married to a proud Italian-American, so it's Italian in my house. That's really not up to me. What's your like knowledge gap that you're sort of self-conscious about? You know, I appreciate cars tremendously, right? But if you ask me what I'm embarrassed about, I should know more about how cars actually work and be able to repair them. That is a knowledge gap, Julie, I'm a little embarrassed about. Are you a fix-it person generally? Like no, I'm terrible. House? I can barely work a <laughs> microwave. I'm awful. <laughs>
college is not affordable for a lot of people, and that's why they have to take out those student loans. Picking up on Blake's point, what should they be looking at in terms of the conditions attached to those loans they're taking out? How should they be calculating whether, in fact, this is something that is doable four years from now while they have to pay it down? So, you know, it, it's so unfortunate that this comes down to the end user, right? The student or the borrower or the parents, they're the ones who have to do the large share of the work. It shouldn't be that way, uh, but they need to be looking at, you know, the most affordable school they can go to. However, whenever we talk to young folks, if you get into Harvard or Stanford, go there, figure it out. And often private schools have uh, better scholarships available for those students. Um, there are programs out there. I live in California for the UC system. There's something called the Blue Gold Scholarship. No one that makes under $80,000 a year needs to pay to go to a, a University of California school, but you have to know about it. You have to do your homework first. And I think we're putting too much pressure on families to have to do this work amongst everything else when they get into school. But as Blake said, the real problem with student loans is on the back end, is that compounding capitalized, you know, capitalizing events um, that is not explained by the loan servicer. And, you know, just a reminder to your audience, our tax dollars pay for these loan servicers to just create more money, more problems for the student loan borrower. You know, N Natalia, you made a great point there in, in thinking about how many students actually know about the scholarships that are available to them. I mean, we heard news just several weeks ago about Sally May acquiring Scholarly, one of the platforms that was really mm -hmm. connecting many of those students with a myriad of different scholarship types that are out there. You know, all that considered, and, and the debt that has ballooned so much, on one side, it's the practices that are predatory from loan servicers or loan offerers. But then on the other side, it's it's the cost of college. Like, when are we going to start thinking about the colleges, the universities? And I know the administration has done some work in this effort, but the, the private institutions that continue to hype up the, the tuition, the costs that are all in for a student and then having to pay that down on the other side, that is a serious issue here. So where where is that starting to get even more of the attention here, Natalia, as well? Yeah, so I I run Student Debt Crisis Center. We firmly believe that college needs to be free in our country. This is not a new idea. Again, I'm from California, Clark Kerr's master plan. We had free college here in California. This is actually going back to the way things used to be. So this is not a, you know, necessarily even a progressive idea that's been around. And we also need to look to the states. The states can do a lot when it comes to paying for college, definitely a lot more than they can do on the student loan side of things. Um, so while we wait for, you know, changes and for anything really big to get passed through the federal government, we can look to the states and put pressure on the states to lower the cost of college. Uh, Blake, uh, you know, let me get to you. In you know, you have basically created a documentary about this very issue, mm -hmm. and I wonder what you found in terms of the lasting impact of taking on these loans. I mean, you were talking about those who've had to declare for bankruptcy. You know, those who have essentially had had to put everything into these loans. I mean, can you share some of those stories about the impact the decision they make now will have? years down the line. Yeah, let me tell you about two people who are in the film and thanks for mentioning it. It's called Lone Wolves and you can, it's been on MSNBC, but you could also find it on Peacock for those of people who are watching. Um, two, two of the stories I wanna tell you about, first is Scott. This was a guy who was the first um, person in his family to ever go to college. He went and did again, what we told people was the right thing to do. He went to college, he got a master's degree. He wanted to be a teacher, that was his dream. He's a very popular teacher, he lives in Maine um, and he teaches English. And he took out these loans and the, he didn't have enough to pay to meet the full payments when he graduated from his graduate program because he was teaching and he was not making a lot of money. And if you don't meet those payments right away, as Natalia and I have talked about, those payments, can, you know, the interest will then escalate. The payments get bigger and bigger. It gets out of control. Fast forward to 10, 20 years later, Scott was looking at what, what initially was like $35,000 in debt is now over $100,000 in debt. It feels totally insurmountable. He's in his 40s. He's got kids. 
and he contemplated taking his life. And, you know, he talks in the film about pulling over into a parking lot, calling his wife and basically saying, I can't do this anymore because he, he felt like he was not providing for his family because the debt had gotten so out of control, they were having to make really tough choices about what they could spend on. And, you know, luckily his wife talked him out of it and he's now become a real advocate uh, for these causes. And so that's very, you know, a sad story that has some sort of inspiring aspect to it. I want to mention another example though, because it's less obvious. I think people, you know, people probably know that there are these kind of crisis stories, but what you hear a lot of the time is, I don't want to get, you know, I don't care about people who are lawyers and doctors that they have student debt. Who cares? Like let them, they're rich. They can pay it down. You know, that's, that's kind of what you hear from the other side. But there was this woman, Vivian, who, um, whose parents had basically no education. They immigrated from other countries, didn't know English. And um, she was the first in her family. She worked her tail off to get into college, got into a great school, uh, went to Cornell, went to a great medical school. And her mother had died of cancer when she was young. And so she decided that she was going to be a doctor. It's all she wanted to do in life. And she lived in a very poor area. And so her idea was she was going to work at one of these uh, kind of low income clinics, a low resource clinic. That was her dream. And it's why she went to med school. And she speaks Spanish and she was going to serve that population. Well, when she graduated med school, she had $250,000 in debt and she could no longer afford to take a job like that. And so there's a cost to society with student debt, right? Like you think about the lawyers who might want to go into public interest law or um, civil rights law, that kind of thing, be public defenders, but they can't because their debt is so high. So they're taking these other jobs um, in the private sector. And there's nothing wrong with that for people who want to do it. But I do think there is an opportunity cost to society um, in, in some of these examples. Yeah, Blake, uh, some really important stories there that no doubt uh, and hopefully serve as a wake up call um, to really better the lives of households as well as, you know, the financial stance for, for the economy and prospects for, for the future here too. Blake and Natalia, we certainly do appreciate the time. Blake Zeff, who is the Lone Wolves director, as well as Natalia Abrams, who is the Student Debt Crisis Center, um, who is over at the Student Debt Crisis Center. Thank you so much for taking the time here today. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, we're checking in on some of today's top trending stories. Ali Canal and Josh Schaefer standing by with what to watch. Hey, Brad. Well, for breakfast, maybe you have some eggs, maybe you have a little breakfast burrito, but it's probably been a minute since you had a bowl of cereal. Not a lot of people eating cereal these days. We're going to break down the numbers and why that is next.
If the markets have taught us anything at Yahoo Finance, it's that things are always moving. Some big news from us, and it's a big mover, literally. We're headed to where all of the movers and shakers live. Yahoo Finance is taking its shows on the road. We'll be teaming up with the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. This puts us right in the action at a pivotal moment for investors. While we're there, we're putting the finishing touches on our new studio and new shows designed for you, the viewer, to help you stay informed and help you make critical decisions throughout the investing day. So come with us on this journey and be part of this exciting time for Yahoo Finance. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Alexandra Canal here with Josh Schaefer, Proz Team Romanian. It's Friday, guys. We got some killer Friday stories. Proz, I want to kick it over to you. Start us off. Yeah, so you know, you don't want to see, right, where you see higher prices and smaller sort of quantities for things. Like think yogurt, yogurt containers or even Starbucks coffee, right? Mm. But it's actually happening. And one company in France is shaming these companies, Carrefour in France, putting labels on certain objects that are saying like, uh, this object cost more money now and had less, fewer quantity of whatever you wanted to buy, yogurt. Uh, in this case, it's, sorry, in this case, it's Lipton iced tea, Pepsi, to boxes of Lindt chocolates. Mm -hmm. And now they're actually, now, now, they're doing this as a public service to people, but also they're trying to shame these suppliers as they re renegotiate new deals. But they want to say, hey, you're getting, your, you're getting less money, less stuff for your money, and actually, they're not changing prices either. So it's the grocery store Shaming, complaining yeah. that yeah. it's now hard to sell the product because it has less in it, because they have to pay the price. Well, they're saying the that. Grocery, the grocery store wants the producers to bring down the prices. Yes, but they're and not, they're not. Interesting but, but play. Why does not have the, to pay the price too, right? right. If Instead of being smug and small. putting shrinkflation on the thing, why, don't you, why doesn't the grocery store just be heroic for the consumer and mark the prices I down? I, I <laughs> How actually, about that? I actually think this tactic is genius. I mean, the French, yeah. they just do it right. They don't care. Yeah. We're gonna say, you know what? If you're gonna raise prices and lower the quantity, yes, exactly. then we're gonna tell consumers that you're doing it because consumers don't really know. Oh yeah, exactly. yeah you, you don't know that, until you buy it. You don't cups. know, you yeah. don't understand. Yeah. And I think it's important to know what you're buying, and I think it's a great tactic. Starbucks tall coffee, right? One from like right. 10 like there's to those eight. TikTok yeah. like yeah. hacks about how you know you do it in different cup sizes and how they're really. Oh my! The movie you. theater one is my favorite one. Which one's, Which one's that, that one? You've they go to they go to a movie theater and they pour in like a large soda and an extra large soda and it's the same amount. They just shape yeah, the cup differently. Yeah, and then they're charging you more. But for then every that? time That's you ridiculous. go to the movie theater, the guy's upselling you by twenty five cents, right? You can't possibly get a medium soda because they're like, well, it's 25 cents more for a large. Right. So then and you end up consumer, getting the XL. You start at the small, sense. you work your way up. Yeah. Oh, that just gets me. Like, that's very deceptive, and I don't like that. I, I like wonder if the grocery store is getting more, more consumers. You would think that that's kind of a thing people like, right? It's pretty funny. I would go to see it. I wonder how it's affecting sales. Well, too. yeah, if you're Pepsi, Lynn yeah. Chocolate, uh, Lipton Iced Tea, I mean, what do you do then, right? You're getting like kind of called out in the store. I, on the shelf, you're getting called out, so mm -hmm. may not be the best thing. But Carrefour, hand it to you guys. Got to hand it to you guys. Nice work. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, Pross, I have my eyes on something else that's in the grocery store, and sales aren't doing too well. Great story in the Wall Street Journal today talking about cereal sales. This is ahead of General Mills reporting earnings next week. General Mills is the biggest supplier or seller of cereals in the country. But interesting, when you take a look at overall cereal sales. So you saw that they jumped 5.2% in 2020, apparently during the pandemic, for some reason we wanted more cereal. And then you go to 2021, down 8.7%, 2022, down 3.9%. To me, it's just because cereal's not that good. And we have better options for breakfast. I don't know what you guys make of this coming down, but I don't know how some of these companies, like the article really gets into, you know, even for General Mills, how do you keep getting people to eat breakfast with you? What sort of different products can you create? Mm -hmm. And I think anything even cereal adjacent just isn't really breakfast and people have slowly realized that. Yeah, I do so, think there's a there's, there's a, a nutritional shift, value problem here that just to exists. More protein based yeah. breakfasts, eggs, uh, just I think the consumer is more health conscious than we were in the 80s. Personally for me, I love breakfast, but I never eat it in, during the work week. I love going to brunch on the weekends, but I feel like when I'm getting up, I'm rushing to get out the door, I don't get hungry right away either. So I'm not gonna sit down and have a bowl of cereal. And for people that are rushing to work too and do need breakfast, usually they're grabbing a bar, they're grabbing a shake. Yeah. The act of sitting down and pouring yourself a milk into the cereal bowl and eating the bowl, that takes a lot of time. And I think the convenience factor is something that consumers appreciate more now. 
You know, it's funny. Uh, I was, I'm looking at where are my high protein cereals? Or where, where is that at? It doesn't really yeah. exist unless you kind of order stuff online. The other thing is that kind of what you're talking about right now, Ali and Josh. She was like, we don't eat breakfast. I, I skip it as a choice. Yeah, yeah I don't. Trying to like not like really go into the fast part of the breakfast, right? Like we're not eating it. We're not. We're skipping it. We're going to something else. The other thing that that I'm, that kind of struck me in that article was about how. The secret, the little secret, the dirty little secret about cereal is like it's an adult indulgence. Adults oh, buy yeah. it I'd rather to eat, eat at night. So yeah. I, I will say, I, that was funny. I was used good. to get like a few years ago, I would get boxes of Special K, and I would eat them. Special K, that was your indulgence. <laughs> yeah, I get, but they have a lot. No of No Captain Crunch, no Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Yeah. I, I'm trying. Cocoa Puffs. I would do the the, the strawberries. Special K, special K strawberry, K, which oh. has a lot of sugar, and I would have that. Wild as Friday night. Well, special K that. strawberry. I, I would eat every now and then. Like, but it's that. not that healthy for you, and I think that. That's what people are starting to realize. Yeah. And then you see companies like Kellogg's, which is just spinning off their cereal division. Yeah. Like, all right, yeah. you go right. over here. We'll focus on snacks, which is a lot more profitable. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see if the future of the cereal can survive. I think it's probably being more bars, like Pross was saying, right? And even just... Well, remember there Special was K, cereal Special bars. Special K does make bars that are pretty remember, good. Remember, like, they have the milk... Like the frozen yeah, milk yeah, bars. Yeah, yeah. Those were so they good. The cinnamon, they had top. cinnamon toast really ones. They had frozen milk bars? Yeah, it was yeah. like, it was like a bar milk? and it yeah. had Fruit Loops and then there was we a We solved milk. cereal's problem in two minutes. I mean, they just we had to bring that. those back. Those were amazing. Whoa, okay. Okay, right. bye. All right, so maybe, you know, maybe you're not eating cereal during the bulk of the week, <laughs> but maybe on Fridays it's a little special thing. And that brings me to the topic. I brought this segment in saying it was Friday. I'm going to bring this segment out on a Friday because the future of the Friday is a little confused right now. So there is an, an interesting article about how post-pandemic, we don't really know what to do with Friday. Pre-pandemic, it was another work day, right? Maybe you could dress a little more casual. Maybe your boss would let you off early to go home. Now, people are working from home. A lot of people are working from home on Fridays if you're in that hybrid work situation. You know, we're in the news business, so we're sort of at the mercy of the news gods, and we have to work on Fridays. The stock market is open. Way to not sell yourself out here. That's okay. <laughs> no, but even I feel this way. Like, I don't know if you feel like Monday through Thursday is so busy, and then by the time you get to Friday, it just feels like the vibe gets a little more... Okay, we're like basically at the weekend, I'm, but not really at the I'm weekend. I'm personally convinced all of my friends that work from home don't work on Fridays. And, More and or less. I, I've seen that. It, I've seen the that with my of friends. There's people that are just doing stuff on Friday. Traveling, afternoon getting their hair done. Not involving their laptop or their line of work mm -hmm. is out. But they're like, saying so they're work from home. And yeah, they they're, just work from home. I and think then, we I don't need know, to make it a three-day Maybe it's because we're coming weekend. out of summer Fridays, too, where a lot of companies were actually doing that as a policy. Yeah. But it does feel like people just kind of log off early now. I don't know. It gets to the conversation we had earlier in the week about happy hour and just the different yeah. work environments. right? And the Frontier Airlines guy talking about, this is ridiculous that people are still working, still working from home in general, let alone on Friday. So, yeah, the Friday has changed, right? That's the vibe that we're, that we're talking about. Um, but... I have to work today early in the morning because this UAW stuff, right? So we're at the, at the behest it, of UAW. our job, our <laughs> job. But I think you're right about the Friday stuff. I mean, it feels like people are just, it used to be a hardcore work day. I think it used to be back It'll be day. interesting to see if you actually hear companies start talking about production coming down because of it, right? Because if it really does feel like less people are working on Friday, and we've talked also about how many work, how many days in the week should people be working, right? And how many hours are you going for mm -hmm. and what that does to production? I mean, if you're actually losing four or five hours every week that people used to be productive on Fridays, like when's the Friday effect? Would you guys take, four, would you guys take less pay to work four days a week? We had this conversation before. The answer is no. I think I would take, I, I mean. I might do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like you can get your work done in four days. You're saying, get, uh, pay me for five days, I'll get it all done in four, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's what you're, you're, you're saying, you don't want He's that. He's a big no. five day He wants that eight hour. Guy. I just love working. Clocking in. I hope my boss is watching. He loves love to working. just clock in. You're doing this very strategically. <laughs> He's eating cereal in the office. <laughs> that's why I don't <laughs> eat cereal. I'm here. Next thing is editor. <laughs> right? I don't he have is, time to eat cereal. Josh is actually in the office very early. <laughs> I will Not say. Not eating cereal. <laughs> well, that will do it for us here at Yahoo Finance. We're going to enjoy the rest of our Fridays. We hope you enjoy yours and we'll be right back with more news on the other side of this break.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with a ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. It's closing time here at Yahoo Finance, and here's a look at some of the top stories of the day. An historic strike getting underway by the United Auto Workers Union. For the first time ever, workers are striking against all three major automakers, but this is a targeted strike with only three plants affected by the stoppage. Nearly 13,000 employees of GM, Stellantis, and Ford walking off the job. President Biden calling on both sides to reach a deal and said the automakers should reward employees as profits have risen. A surprise shakeup at Planet Fitness. Longtime CEO Chris Rondeau ousted by the company's board and the stock sliding to a 52-week low on the news. It's unclear what spurred the move, but board director Craig Benson will take over as interim CEO. Plus, Instacart raising the price range of its upcoming initial public offering. It's now set to price shares between $28 and $30 apiece. The company likely to price shares after the close on Monday and will start trading on Tuesday. Well, here's a look at what to watch next week. Wednesday is the big day on Wall Street with the Fed decision. The central bank is widely expected to hold rates steady at this meeting, but investors are pricing in at least one more high rate hike this year. The decision will be announced at 2 p.m. and we will be live to bring you analysis in the news conference from Fed Chair Jerome Powell. It'll be a busy week for the housing sector. A slew of data is expected from home builder sentiment to housing starts and existing home sales. On the earnings front, among the companies we'll hear from include AutoZone, FedEx, General Mills, KB Home, and Darden. And Russia's invasion of Ukraine is expected to be the major focus of the UN General Assembly kicking off on Monday. President Biden will be attending, but he is expected to be the only permanent member of the Security Council attending. On Wednesday, he's set to hold a meeting on the sidelines with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back here on Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern, for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a great weekend.